As Josue mentioned this morning, the sermons for the second service Sundays in June, July, and August will be based on passages from the Psalms, specifically from the sections known as the Songs of Ascents. They're Psalms 120 through 134, if you care to go back and look at those after this evening. Tradition suggests they were sung by pilgrims traveling to the mountain of God, or Zion, to worship. In Psalm 121, the first verse suggests why this psalm was included among the songs of ascents. The psalmist's vision is set firmly on the final goal, Jerusalem, and Zion, the hill of God. You'll notice shift in pronouns when we read this passage. Going from I to you could represent an internal dialogue or more likely the words of the pilgrim beginning the psalm followed by words of assurance being spoken by a priest or another person. Uh, before I read, uh, let's pray together. Help me, Father, we op- ask that you open our hearts and minds to your word. We thank you that you give us the opportunity to, to hear your word read. And we pray that you will use my reading today and my preaching to open hearts, that you will use me and speak through these words as I read and as we hear your word and see how it works in our lives, we ask that you receive the honor and glory that's due your name as we explore this Songs of Ascent. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So as you were on a trip, did you ever find the time where you got lost? Whether it was a place that you thought you knew where to go or a new place that you're looking for. And as as Josue mentioned this morning, uh, maybe it was before GPS. So... uh, you're traveling, you're looking around, all of a sudden something doesn't feel right. At first, you don't want to admit that you're lost, and you try to find your own way on your own. But when you realize that you need to ask for assistance, there's no one there to ask, because you didn't stop at that gas station at the last uh, intersection. Well, Psalm 121 addresses people who are afraid of losing their way. They know that being God's people does not make them immune to life's issues. When we have fallen or lost our way, the psalmist calls us to perceive the truth about God that overarches the circumstances we face. God is ever-present, all-knowing, and possesses all power. These are more than theological concepts, but realities that can help us deal with life's pressures, perplexities, and problems. Let's look at these eight verses and see how God guides us through his word. This is one of the traveler's hymns meant to reassure the pilgrim as he journeyed most likely to Jerusalem. This is a psalm of assurance that we are not alone, no matter where we are on our journey and whether we are awake and fully conscious or asleep. God is with us even in our loneliest and most fearful moments. There's comfort in knowing and believing that the God who is capable of creating an entire world also knows and cares intimately about each of us. We are not alone. God walks beside us every step of the way. Now, as we look at this scripture, I've broken it out into three sections. Verses 1 and 2, who helps you? Verses 3 through 6, who keeps you? And verses 7 and 8, who protects you? So let's look at verses 1 and 2. Who helps you? I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Verse 1 can be understood in several different ways. The psalmist may be looking 
towards his destination, Zion, the mountain of God, and anticipating the help that God will provide. He may be thinking of the dangers of travel, which were great at that time, through the isolated mountain region and reminding himself of the God who goes with him. Or he may be thinking of the mountains and their role in the idol worship of the nations that surround Israel. Mountaintops were often the sites of altars of Baal. In contrast, the psalmist looks to the God who created the mountains for his help. In looking out, the psalmist realizes that he needs to ask for help. Sometimes we need a little help. Other times we have a great need for help. But we always need help. Many times, however, we try to solve our problems by ourselves. We can be a stubborn, independent people and will try to handle life on our own. When you were learning to ride a bike, did you just say, I can do this myself, I don't need your help? Didn't someone else really help you then at the end to get you started and then you were able to take off and ride? Maybe you thought you could bake cookies or fix a dinner without any help or guidance because you'd seen it a lot done before. Maybe the men and women here today can see where you were assembling a new gas grill or something from Ikea and try to do it without looking at the directions. Sometimes these situations worked out. More than likely, though, I suspect that each of us needed to ask for help or read the directions. So as God's people, we know that we need help. We also know that this help can be found in someone who knows us and that we trust. Many times our help comes from a friend or a family member. But we know that God is always there to guide us. Jesus said in John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So we know that God is our help. So why can we count on God to be there for us? Genesis 1.1 reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. From Psalm 104 he sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. John 1, 1 through 4 begins like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. God is our creator and wants us to live abundantly. Jesus, who was with God in the beginning, also is our help in time of need. The writer of Hebrews uses Old Testament scripture to provide comfort. The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can join with the psalmist in confessing our trust in the Lord. Next, who keeps you? Verses 3 through 6. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. He will not let your foot be moved. That sounds like an odd sentence to include in here. But if you remember, during that time, when they traveled through the mountains, it was very dangerous, treacherous, slippery route. So they had to have some assurance they had solid footing. And if we consider solid footing what we need from God, then that makes sense that we want to see where God is keeping our foot from being moved in the wrong direction. Sometimes it reminds us when we needed just some help to either start walking, to ice skate, or maybe we just needed somebody there when we had a difficult time. Your Savior Jesus is always with you, keeping you safe. But why would the psalmist include the part, he who watches over you will not sleep? This takes us back to the story in 1 Kings 18, where Elijah and the priests of Baal set up altars for sacrificing bulls to their gods. Each group set up the altars, and the priests waited for Baal to start the fire for the sacrifice. Baal did not respond to the cries and pleas of the prophets of Baal. Elijah began to taunt the crowd. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. We never need to wake up God. 
He's always there watching over us, and he's always there caring for us. Psalm 1-6 says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked will perish. A key ver- word in this verse, in this passage, is keeps, as it occurs in some form six times. Dictionary definitions include have or retain possession of, as well as cause to continue in a specific condition, position, course, etc. To keep also means to have and to hold on to someone or something. Some synonyms of keep include carry, preserve, retain, and save. In this context, it shows God's love and care for his people as he watches over us. God provides the shade we need to protect us from the heat of life. Shadow or shade was a conventional Hebrew metaphor for protection against oppression. The Lord is the protective shade of his people. From Psalm 91, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, El Shaddai. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. There are many references of God as our refuge. From Psalm 9, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for Lord, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. From Psalm 18, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God was always with the Israelites during their years of bondage, wandering, and later exile from Jerusalem. Isaiah praises God's deliverance in chapter 25. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like the heat of the desert." You silence the uproar of foreigners. As heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. Isaiah continues in chapter 49. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat, nor the sun beat upon them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and will lead them beside springs of water. Jesus asked God to protect his disciples and us in his prayer from John 17. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. My prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus asked God to protect his disciples, including all believers, including us. Jesus knows how we need protection from the evil one and that God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is the only source of protection that we have. So as we transition to our last section, who protects you? Verses seven and eight. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your goings out and coming in from this time forth and forevermore. As we've seen earlier, God provides protection and refuge for his children. 1 John 5 helps make this clear. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. The people of the Old Testament trusted God to guide them and protect them. We, have, we can trust in God with Jesus and the Holy Spirit to guide and protect us. All we need to do is trust in him and ask for his help. The 23rd Psalm is a psalm of praise, a profession of joyful trust in the Lord as the good shepherd and king. 
Close your eyes and listen as I read this familiar and favorite hymn. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As you open your eyes, did you find yourself looking up to the hills, looking up to see God, looking to a place that you know he has been with you in the past and in a place that you are confident he will be with you in the future. God promises to be with us and will guide and protect us if we just seek him. Does this mean that you always have an easy time in your life? No, this is not what God has promised. The Bible is realistic and honest about the harsh life that we sometimes may face. At no time does it give the faintest suggestion that a life of faith exempts us from a life of difficulties. What it does promise is preservation from all the evil in the midst of trials. Our understanding of God's magnitude and greatness directly impacts our prayer life in times of trouble. Let me close with this doxology that ends the epistle of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time where you teach us through your word, where you Help us to understand where our help comes and where we can turn in difficult times. Help us to recognize, though, that we can rejoice in the recovery and the, rec- you know, the, the things that you help us to recover from. We thank you for your Son and your Spirit as we have a great triune God who is personal and is reflecting your goodness and mercy and grace in our lives, and we're thankful that you call us to be your children. Pray that we will serve you well and give you honor and glory in all that we say and do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.